Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? So far in the last seven days, we've seen news about the impact of the new virus variants, objections and praise for the vaccines and the various centres used to distribute them, horrifying news about Australia with yet another plague of spiders coming due to weather changes, and other news items. Let's begin with the impact of the new virus variants. This comes from the New York Times, and fundamentally it argues that as more successful countries are able to implement vaccines, less developed nations are not able to. This means less developed nations are not able to recover, but also, somewhat more importantly, they're more likely to develop mutated versions of the virus. The example used is that of South Africa in particular, which has its own version of the CCP virus. The virus is more infectious, and as a result of more infections, there's a far higher death toll. The South African variant and others are becoming more of a problem in these poor countries. If you're in a developed nation that both has a supply of vaccines, primarily from manufacturers, or can afford to buy them and bring them in, these mutated variants are not such a concern. Any of the current four and prospectively five very soon vaccines will be effective against them. The argument in principle, as we have said, is sound, except for one small caveat. There is something called COVAX. COVAX is a program in place through the World Health Organization to deal with exactly this problem. COVAX had three major goals. First was the development of a vaccine. Second, the production. And third is the equitable access to testing, treatment, and vaccines. The idea behind this is that in order for the world to be protected from the CCP virus, all the world needed to be vaccinated. It does this by covering at least 20% of a given country's population, managing the portfolio of available vaccines, delivering them, and trying to rebuild economies. These four pillars are enough that it takes away the initial burden on a country and allows them to not only return to functioning, but get their medical systems running again, have a distribution network for vaccines that they can then pay for themselves and continue supplying themselves, but also have a very good head start on the process. This is the main reason why, although the Times article has merit to it, it is not the be-all and end-all that it is made out to be. Unfortunately, the article puts the burden of ensuring that a country has access to vaccines not on the country and the government that runs it, but rather on everyone else. And whilst yes, there are to some degree barriers to this, it's not on everybody else to fund these other countries. There's a certain obligation from a moral and ethical point of view, but from a practical point of view, one country cannot subsidize another. While on the topic of vaccines, the next piece of news relates to the effective distribution of vaccines. At least in America, there is a strong anti-vaxxer movement. Whilst present in other countries, none are quite as vocal or active. The exact example given here comes from Los Angeles, the same county that has had quite a drastic impact from the CCP virus, whether that is overloaded medical systems, a lack of basic medical supplies like oxygen, or more and more people dying every day. You would think that based on this, any vaccination system would be embraced wholeheartedly. Except this is America, and at least in LA County, at the Dodgers Stadium, the vaccination site had to be shut down because people were protesting. Admittedly, only 50 protesters, but still, these 50 people prevented hundreds who had been waiting for their vaccinations from getting them. People who had been waiting hours. 
This is one of the parts of America where vaccines are being rolled out on a very stringent basis, where they select people based on the need for the vaccine. It begins with frontline healthcare workers and those who will be exposed, then the elderly, then the less elderly, then those who are going to be engaging with the public on a less regular but wider basis, and then the wider public in its entirety. The fact that there are people trying to prevent healthcare workers and frontline staff from getting vaccinated, thereby drastically reducing the spread of the CCP virus, because as they claim it's not real, it is just ridiculous. This sort of nonsense is what contributes to more than 16,000 people who are dying. That's more than 16,000 in LA County alone. There are more than 7,000 new cases in the last week alone. And there are people saying the disease is not real and that the vaccine shouldn't be taken. This nonsense is on top of the increasing spread of the novel mutations of the CCP virus. It's fine for people to not take the vaccine if they don't want to do so. Although we think it's a ridiculous decision, it is their right to do so. Preventing others from exercising their right to make an informed decision themselves isn't okay. Further vaccine news involves taking two of the currently approved vaccines, that being the Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine, and using a mixture of the two. This is based on UK research where the CCP virus is a far bigger problem than in other places. The theory is to take one of the vaccines and give the first dose using that. Two weeks later, to then give the second vaccine as a second dose. The underlying theoretical result would be a long-lasting immunogenicity to the CCP virus. This has a number of benefits, regardless of what happens if it proves possible. Even if we're not seeing the same degree of immunogenicity from getting two different vaccinations for one disease, it is possible that it would open the door for the use of different vaccines based on availability. If we're talking about somewhere like Africa, where the availability of vaccines may be limited, and you've been given one, if you can have another and it is just as effective with the end result, it would drastically increase the ability to access the most cost-effective vaccines, import them and deploy them. As of this video, there are currently four approved vaccines in America. There are also two more, one from Russia and one from China, which have not been approved but theoretically could be used. Johnson & Johnson is the next candidate to be the fifth approved vaccine in America. The company intends to report results of its trials by next week. They've also claimed that if they are given approval by the FDA, they could deliver 100 million doses for the United States of America by the end of June. This means in roughly five months, they could deploy 100 million doses or 20 million doses a month, 5 million doses a week. This is yet another element to trying to mitigate some of the impact that is being felt by the very high demand, especially in America where there are 330 million people, and the ability to produce enough vaccine for everyone who requires it. 100 million doses may not go that far in five months if, like other vaccines, two doses are required. That is 50 million Americans who could be immunized by the middle of this year. 50 million more than would otherwise be possible without a fifth vaccine. These vaccines are more important than you might realize. Whilst yes, the incredible death toll from the CCP virus is horrifying. It is not the only concern. We've already mentioned the possible implications for long-term psychiatric disorders and a raft of other problems. 
one more that goes on this list is the issues of fertility when it comes to men. Sperm is produced in the male bodies in the testes. From here, it travels up the vas deferens and is ejaculated out. The testes have a number of cells in them. Some of these contain a large number of ACE2 receptors. ACE2 receptors are the current primary mechanism by which the CCP virus invades a host cell. Based on this, it stands to reason that testes would be impacted by infection by the CCP virus. While this was not well evidenced in the case of SARS, the CCP virus appears to have much better evidence to support that conclusion. One study being run between Germany and Iran looked at 84 men with the CCP virus and 105 without. In short, they found that the sperm in men who had been infected were three times slower and were far lower in count than their control counterparts. As we previously reported, at least in the West, with the reduced sperm count across the board, anything that further reduces it again is going to impact on fertility regardless. And although at the moment the broad average fertility is not a concern, the possible implications of this could see a huge reduction in children going forwards that isn't associated with lifestyle social and cultural factors, but is instead almost entirely biological. While men are seeing a reduction in sperm count and in the speed of their sperm, is it possible that mothers who have been infected by the CCP virus could give their children immunity? This is what one study that has been published in the past week looks at. They were examining blood samples from a little under 1,500 women. A very small fraction, 83, had tested positive for the CCP virus. The 83 women who were pregnant when they were infected by the CCP virus appear to have had an association with increased transfer of antibodies to their children. The association was, in short, the longer the time between infection and delivery, the more the antibodies were transferred. This is true whether they were asymptomatic or not. The caveat to this study is that the antibodies found were IgG. IgG is one of the few antibodies that can move from the mother and into the placenta. Of the 83 children, 72 were positive, 11 were not. Of these 11, 6 had mothers with very low IgG levels. This would indicate, at least in theory, that the infection had been very recent and the mother had yet to rally their immune system to fight it off. The remaining 5 children had mothers that only had IgM antibodies. IgM cannot move across the placenta. IgM also only appears in the early stages of infection. This means that these five mothers were even earlier in the infection process than the mothers who had very low levels of IgG. Overall, if it is true that mothers can impart some degree of immunity to children through infection, it is possible that vaccination could achieve a somewhat similar result throughout the early period of the child's life. If the mother can pass on antibodies and provide a degree of protection, it will at least somewhat mitigate the risk for children early on. But at the moment, the body of evidence is still wanting. At least the one piece of positive news to come out of this study is that it would appear none of the children at any point were infected by the CCP virus while still in the womb. While still on the topic of motherhood, Research into autism often focuses on the father, although it is recognised that autism is highly heritable. It's generally considered to be a predominantly male condition. This is where research from the University of California, Davis and Stanford University looks at the mother in question. 
They took plasma from 450 mothers from children with autism and 342 mothers who did not have children with autism. They were trying to figure out whether or not there is a simple enzyme-linked assay. This is commonly called an ELISA. It's a relatively straightforward test that uses antibodies to bind to a particular marker and it will then activate and this will give a signal. This could be fluorescence or some other measurable method. By doing this, they could figure out whether or not there are indicators in the mother of the chances of a child developing autism by taking a range of factors that are associated with autistic children being born to a mother, they could isolate which of them are indicators of this occurring. In fact, they found eight. And what is even more interesting is that in a constellation of factors, these eight could be used with 100% accuracy. The use for tests like this and others is very straightforward. Autistic children are often in need of more intensive caring, and if parents aren't in a position where they feel confident in providing that support and structure, they can make an informed decision about attempting to get pregnant based on a relatively straightforward blood test, or at least as far as the mother is concerned. It can significantly inform them about the probability of having an autistic child. Next, we want to talk about another neuropathology of sorts, or at least one that might prove to be such. Depression is a common psychiatric disorder. In fact, it's perhaps one of the most common. The changes it has on the brain, though, aren't as clear. This is where a comparison of brain tissues from those who have committed suicide and have chronic depression finds some interesting results, particularly around the structure and support of nerve cells. The Douglas Mental Health University and the McGill University in Canada took a very small sample of brain tissue from 10 men with depression. The 10 men had killed themselves. What they found was that there was a reduction in the number of astrocytes. Astrocytes are cells in the brain that support neurons. While knowing that this exists and is a phenomena that can be seen, the exact implications aren't yet obvious. It could be useful in designing and targeting specific medications to deal with depression better. While we're talking about dealing with things better, there's a interesting series of pictures that have been published. These show bacteria changing their physical shape to deal with antibiotics. It's often thought that antibiotics are often dealt with, at least as far as antibiotic resistance is concerned, by genetic changes. And this is largely true. If you don't have the right target site for an antibiotic to act on, it obviously won't have its intended effect. There is a somewhat simpler approach to this though that doesn't involve mutations, multiple generations, and the hope that you survive long enough to develop resistance to antibiotics, physically preventing the antibiotic from getting to where it has to be to have its effect is just as good. The researchers hypothesize that at least in part this is a matter of volume versus surface area. In short, the larger the surface area, the smaller the volume is relative to that. This means that the bigger a cell is, the more surface area there is for antibiotics to get into it. If you reduce the surface area, as these microbes are doing, by turning into a C shape, you can, in theory, minimize the amount of volume and surface area for the antibiotic to have an effect on it. While the next piece of news isn't about novel genetics, exactly, it is on something novel, a novel species of whale. This is an update to news from 2019. In 2019, a just under 12 meter long whale washed ashore in Florida. This very large whale was, in short, killed by a piece of plastic in its gut. That explains why it was underweight. 
it was originally thought to be a subspecies of the Brutus whale, but that proved not to be the case. This is known after genetic analysis of this and other whales. In other animal-related news, researchers found that some spiders can develop more complex tools from their web. The spider silk web is used to create a mechanism that forces and pulls their prey into the middle of the net where they become food. This is done with a catapult-like mechanism. It's said that ants can lift something many times their own weight. Well, in this case, spiders can move something more than 50 times heavier than themselves using their spider silk. By itself, seeing this is somewhat disconcerting. It's when you realize that it's not just one example or one species, but a number of species of spider that can do this that the size of their prey can become quite large, some being small lizards and birds. Using their simple machine, the spider is able to lift their prey at a rate of about one-tenth of a millimeter every second. That is one centimeter every 100 seconds. They do not do so in a single action and with a single thread, but instead they have to attach more thread to it each time it raises the prey up. This means that in order to raise the prey one centimeter, 100 threads would have to be used. Finally, we go to Australia. As much as people may deny Australia's existence, this horror show is perfect evidence of why it's certainly real. The native flora and fauna in Australia are perhaps some of the most exotic and interesting. Whether this ranges from their larger bipedal creatures known as the kangaroo, or to something as small as their jellyfish. In between these are their spiders, and they are host to some of the most poisonous spiders in the world. As with just about everything else in Australia, these spiders have developed to deal with the extreme weather conditions and the kill everything that you find approach. In this case, the picture you see here is a very large number of baby huntsman spiders. This massive number of spiders occurred due to recent weather in Australia. Clearly this can't be something particularly new to Australians as in the video the Children are heard saying, Mum, we've got a bunch of spiders up there. And they're looking at this. And you go in the daughter's room, and she says, Mum, you've got a bunch of spiders up there. Little babies one. And she's like, oh, that's not too bad. It's just like maybe 50, 60. But then she says, look in the other corner. There's more. And they're alive. I think the baby huntsman, I'm not sure. That's so cute! I'm not gonna kill them. We keep them all over the house. We never ever have gonna have mozzies again. <laughs> Are you moving out now? Shall we burn the house down? Yeah. <laughs> we might have to do that. Yes, Australians. Dealing with the weird and bizarre as calmly as you can since 1788. The Australian Huntsman spider gets to a leg span of about 12.5 centimeters or 5 inches, and a body length of 2.5 centimeters or 1 inch. As mentioned, they've learned to cope, or at least evolved, to cope with Australia's extreme weather. During summer, they do two things. One is the population increases exponentially. Two, they try and find somewhere cooler and more comfortable, such as the inside of a house. The warm, somewhat moist air of the house is ideal for baby spiders, and so the eggs hatch and the spiders begin growing, and then cannibalizing each other. This is why such a large number of spiders would have been preceded by an even larger number of smaller spiders. 
And that's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions that you have below.